I want to give a brief introduction for just a minute. When I came to Yeshiva in ninth grade, and I, I was like walking into a wall and levels of culture shock, of uh, all kinds of other things. I mean, East Coast and West Coast, I already, but well, my wife and I were dating. So someone said, oh, how can an Ashkenazi person date a Sephardic person? And when he went to ask a rabbi, he said, you know, the biggest problem between you are going to be that you're from the East Coast and the West Coast. Nothing to do with where your grandparents came from. And the truth is, there's a big difference in the East Coast and the West Coast. Um, when I came to Yeshiva and I discovered this whole different style of Judaism that I wasn't really exposed to as a kid growing up in San Diego, California, um, some of the things were challenging for me. I mean, some of them were difficult, some were hard, some were incredible. Some I'd never been exposed to before. Some were beautiful. Um, and in ninth grade, I got to spend every single Friday night with uh, Rabbi Ramani Dezla at their house. They used to do it only for Shabbat for us. We would sing together, we would eat together. And I kind of felt like I had a home away from home. That happened to me in ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade, my first year out of high school. And then I moved to Israel, but the connection between us always stayed uh, close. Uh, Revezor's children are my friends. And I even know so far as there's a, one of their children is in their own class in Baltimore. So the, the worlds keep meeting and meeting and meeting. When I first came to Friday night services, I'm used to, I, I grew up kind of a you know, Chabad or dancing. I came to Yeshiva and they were dancing, forget dancing. The songs that they were singing were, were I don't know, they were slow and they were somber and they were, they, it, was, it, was, it was slow, you know. Um, my wife is Hasidic, so they always joke that like Tisha B'Av is the Lithuanian national holiday. Now that's the, it's like the, the Purim of, but I, it's a different style. And everyone approaches the Kodesh Baruch with their own style, and, and everyone has what to give to Amis Leib. But when I came to complain to Rav Ezra, I said, you know, I have a hard time. All these songs are singing are very slow. Rav Ezra told me, you're lucky they're singing. I remember when they didn't even used to sing. And, and it, seems, it seems like uh, that was already a, a, a move into the future. But you learn to realize very quickly that these little details, they don't really make a difference. When you come to study Torah, when you come to learn Torah, you can learn from everybody. You can learn from every part of Am Yisrael, from every zera, uh, from every stream of, of Am Yisrael. Uh, but I think what I want to give a Ka'at to, because I don't usually get this opportunity to say a Ka'at Tov, and that is that most of my philosophy that I teach here today, that we learn together here today, and that this community is built on, are the philosophy of G'dolei Sfarad, the giants of Sfarad, not, God forbid, to exclude the giants of Ashkenaz. But it was a philosophy that I, I really fully developed in Israel, but the beginning of which I got in Rabbi Ezra's living room. Uh, Rabbi Ezra's house, I'm assuming it only got worse since then, Rabbi. But full of books. Everywhere you go are books. I inherited the problem. And there's uh, more books than there are bookshelves. And there were all kinds. I remember the first time a Mishpate Uziel, Rabbi Uziel, Shalit Vichuvot came in. It was like a Yom Tov in Rabbi Ezra's house. And we, I remember learning, I didn't even know who was Rabbi Uziel. But I can tell you that so many years later, Rav Uziel changed my life. I remember bumping into the biography of Chacham Wadi Yosef. At that time I was convinced, maybe I'm not even Sephardic, maybe I'm... And I, I found this biography at Rav Ezra's house, and I read it one Friday night from cover to cover. And I fell in love with this personality. The Ben Ishchai, some of the writings of the Ben Ishchai that I would have never discovered on my own. And so on and so forth. All of that started the writings of the Chida. I met them in Rav Ezra's living room also. I would have never had that opportunity had it not been for Rav Ezra and his Rabbanit and their house and their, and their warmth to me and their openness to me. And uh, I know there's, um, I forgot your mother-in-law's name. Mrs. Castile. Mrs. Castile, you are very lucky to have such children and we're very lucky to have you in our community, Bokhajem. And Yosef, thank you for joining us. I hope to see you more often now that we've discovered each other. And I really ask you to just sit down. Uh, don't sit back and enjoy the show. Be involved, participate. This is going to be something very special. And for me, I really want to just say thank you uh, for coming here to be with us. Thank you. Amen. To me, it's more of a big honor when, when somebody you know invites you to speak. And I love sharing, so it, it makes both of us happy. Um, I'm just going to go straight into it because it's already, uh, I don't want to delay everybody. Uh, the main presentation is all about the one type of the Yemenite and Moroccan Masora. I really there's four, and we're going to see there's a lot more that we lost. And it's going to take us to the Chumash Rashi, and I'll explain, and the Moroccan, the questions on it, and the one that I presented was the one, is the locust that swarms. What? That's the only one that uh, I have one, and I'll, I'll share with you as we go through. Uh, I, we're going to hit the light. This, this yeah, those are the two. Two of them? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to, it's going to go through the Chumash Rashi, through the Gemara, and through the Allah. It's a lot of information. 
I'm going to simplify it and but the basis is the Chumash, so the Chumash part I'm going to read and just translate. This is Vayikra, Parshat uh, Shmini. Kol sheretz ha'of ha'olech al arba sheketz luchim. All crawly things that fly, insects that fly, that walk and four is forbidden. Is abomination. Ach et zetuch luch, but there's an exception. This you could eat. Sheretz ha'of, it flies. Ha'olech al arba, walks with four. Ach lo lo, this is a k'tiv. The way it's written with a lamed olive, and lo, the way it's read with lamed vav, um, and some people say it's a textual error. We're not sure. That's not true. We have in tradition that they both. We learn both from lo not and lo meaning yes. Crime. The John will do more with that. Crime is the jumping legs, right? And over here it's mimal leraglo above its legs lenater by malar. It has jumping legs that are higher. Simple. And we'll go more into that. So it tells you the the signs, and then it gives you four examples. All right, tohlu. These are the types. Ha'arbe, which is the one that I will present, and you'll see tons of pictures, is the locust that swarms. Lemino and its type. Et salam lemineu, et chargo lemineu, et chargo lemineu. It gives you four examples. Arbe, salam, chargo, and chago. Nowadays they call everybody, all of them, they call it, they lump them into one group called Chava Gav, which is grasshoppers. And we're going to deal with why do we need the, the description and plus four samples. And at the end it ends, called Sheretz Of, all the crawly things that flies, Asher Lo Arba Aglaim has four legs, Sheket Zulafem, again it's abomination. So we're going to take, there's a Rashi over here, which is the foundation of everything, so we're going to, all this whole Rashi is going to come up with slides in a few words each one. So the first part is, this is the grasshopper that Rashi seems to describe. It looks different than our grasshoppers because it seems it is. The jumping legs is in the front, because Rashi says on this part, Mimal of the jumping leg, I Tzavar is close to its neck, has Yeshlo Kimin Shteraglaim has two legs, Levad me'arba, besides of four. This is what Rashi seems to describe. It's not the standard one. I'm going to use it in the beginning. Later on, we'll, we'll switch. I mean, yeah. So having the jumping legs at the front, uh, aerodynamically, doesn't seem to make much sense. Okay, very because, good. Because uh, you spring from the back when you right. want to get but you right. spring from the front, it's like you're going to go pick up poof. Right. So we're going to see that that's why the Masar is not based on this, but there are some people that insist that this is Rashi's sample, and we, even though we don't have such a thing, and we're going to see in nature they seem to have, for example, this is, anybody knows? Praying Mantis. Praying Mantis. It's praying wonderful. All right? Uh, and it seemed to have the bigger legs in the front, and the question is, is that something to what Rashi is talking about? Um, here's another one. It's a middle shmanesra, right? <laughs> Notice that there's two legs here, two legs on the other side, and these four larger legs. There's also cicada, comes wonderfully every 17 years. It's a swarm that comes to Baltimore. It's an interesting thing. They, they come out, they yakety yak, they <laughs> swarm, that's the call for the female. They mate in the trees, they drop to the ground for 17 years. They dig down, and then Again, 17 years, the same thing happened. When they come out and swarm, it's all over the place. So I know my Rebbe Rebbe Heinemann always says, what's the reason for such a creation? 17 years, they disappear, they come out for a period of time, and then they go back in. He said, it could be to remind us of Tchia Sameter, the revival of the dead. If you want to see such a thing in nature, here you go. 17 years into the ground, and then they come up for a, couple, for a month or so, a couple of months, then they disappear. Wow. It's unbelievable. They may the egg drops to the ground, digs, stays for 17 years, comes up again, and so on and so forth. It's like a big roach. Um, <laughs> what? They're absolutely disgusting. <laughs> yeah, they were. He was there for the occasion. So, uh, there, there, of all the years I ever had to be there was the 17th year, like a biblical curse. <laughs> it's blind, they so, fly all over you, they... <laughs> the, reason, the reason I bring it up here, because it's also a type of locust, but it's not that type. The arbe is literally means a lot, because referring to the one that I'm going to present is the locust. But if you notice, also has two legs, arms, and 
Again, it's not used for the jumbo. We're going to get back to that. I just showed you two samples. This is a continuation with Rashi. Rashi explains when it wants to fly, and it jumps from the ground, it uses jumping legs, is explaining the jumping leg. And then what happens is those two springs it off and the wings open and it flies. That basically, Rashi is describing a simple grasshopper. A launcher. A launcher. Now, Rashi says, We have tons of them around. We call them lagosta. Right? And but we're not expert with them. So this I took from the internet it has about five thousand. I saw another version that's much more, about twenty thousand, depending if you count crickets and cadids and so on and so forth. But the Gemara says, Tani Avimi Sheva Dagim Hem. Ravao says we have seven hundred types of kosher fish. Right? Shmona Meot Chagavim. 800 times of kosher grass out there. And we're down to four or one. I'm missing a whole Jewish cuisine. Here. A whole, right. <laughs> okay, imagine the recipes. <laughs> uh, when they had the cicadas, all of a sudden all the recipes of cicadas come out in the market. It's oh. unbelievable. And they eat them as a uh, real crispy. Yeah. So this is the langosta. Notice of here. The, there's two translations of the Rashi of Langosta, but it ended up being from French, it ended up being a Spanish word today is referring to grasshoppers. Did, langosta. Don't they have them in the marketplaces in North Africa? Yeah, the yeah, they do have them yeah. there, because there's a band where this type, specifically this one, is swarms, and while it swarms and eats everything else, they eat it, and they fry them, and mm. it's, it's divine <laughs> justice. <laughs> okay, so here is... This is the crux of the the requirement. So it says Sha'arba Simanim, there's four qualifications, right? Shinem Rubahim that said it. Arba Aglaim has four legs. So I, I colored red. There's four legs. There's two on this side and two. This is not considered legs raglaim. I have Arba Knafaim, four wings. This we're gonna see more. There's the hard one and then the softer one underneath, two on this side, two on that side. Karsulaim elu crime of Tuvimkan, the Karsulaim are the jumping leg that we're talking about here. And then it says over here that the wings cover most of its body. This is the body. Now, in this picture, it's not a good picture, but we'll see more of what it covers most of the body. This is the basic qualification of a kosher grasshopper. We're going to. Here we go. Two jumping legs. Four walking legs, wings covering, and then this is the four legs also, this is a jumping leg. This is the wings, the hard and the soft one. And these are ones without wings, and obviously this one be kosher. Have you ever tried No. <laughs> I didn't have the merit. Over here you have just a picture of the wings. One, two, three, four. This is one that's closed. Okay, now going back with the qualification, here's a checklist. Does it have four walking legs? Yes, one, two, three, four. This is a praying mantis. Does it have two jumping legs? No. So that right away knocks it out, even though it has some sort of four wings and the cover. So there's the wings, and you can see that it would cover most of its body. So sorry, no praying mantis. How about cicada? So here's a checklist again. Four walking legs. Okay, you can see it. Alright, two jumping legs? No. Four wings? Okay, well here you can see one, two, one, two. And does it cover most of the body? It does. But it doesn't qualify. Okay, no cicada uh, recipes. Now, I just to just explain, when they come out, this is the way they look. When they, after 17 years, when they dig up, they come out with a hard black shell like that and they crawl up and they dig. These hard are not jumping, they're used for actually grabbing and eating. But this is the pre of that. It, it climbs up the tree, it sheds it, and then it ends up like that and then they fly yakety yakking for their mates and then the whole cycle again, they give birth, goes down, and then they, they develop this hard shell, it crawls up, you see the shells on the side of the trees. Okay, this is the kosher one, and this is an actual one that I got every few years. They have the Masora dinner, and they actually serve 
for depending on where you go. The one in in Eretz Yisrael where where they actually had the Masorah dinner, they served different exotic things. One of them is they had the Yemenites actually fry them and serve them. Uh, this is the one they had in New York. They refused to serve them because there too many questions about eating them, and we'll see why. So they had samples in, in jars, and one of the couples that went there brought me two. One of them, this one also died. That's why the body's not covered well, because when it died and shrink on me, it's lost it. So, so but what is the Masara dinner? The Masara dinner is every uh, year or two years, they do is they have a lot of people come and they serve them exotic things of like giraffe meat and they talk about it. They have speakers and they talk about grasshoppers and they serve grasshoppers. They talk about giraffe, they talk about buffaloes and all the questions, a quail, and they talk about the misar of it and they actually serve it for people that are willing to pay. A lot of money. <laughs> so, the, so in the one in, in America that they did, and they keep on doing, they don't, they refuse to serve it. They have them in cans and, uh, I mean, in containers, but they won't serve it because they held that you can't rely on somebody else to feed them. The one in Eretz Shell, they served it. In fact, the the Yemenite that wanted to serve it asked her, Vadya, can I make it? Is going to make my restaurant trafe? And he said, no. But so they actually served it, and they asked, "Ask your own Shiloh if you can eat it or not." I will deal with that at the end a little bit more. So now this is the kosher type, and this is the min arbe. So, uh, if you can figure out how to read that, <laughs> any any. any, any? Okay. It, this is the one that I'm representing, and it's the one that's called arbe in the puzzle because it comes in swarm. So. And notice again, it has, this is the qualifications, jumping legs, four wings, four legs, two jumping legs, the wing covers most of his body, and That's we're going to talk more about that. Okay, now Rashi, this is continuing with Rashi. Kol simani malalu mitsuyim binotenu. Really, all of them have it. If you look at the grasshoppers out here, they also have it. No. Aval yesh sherosh an aroch, yesh yen lime zav. Some have long heads, like this one has a long head. It doesn't look like the normal one. And Rashi is going to say something about it in a minute. Here's another one, different type of long head. You see, notice it's long and cone-like shape. Uh, plus, some of them have tails, some of them don't have tails. Uh, this is, has, now, you'll see in halacha, this is not really, this is a kated, but in halacha it's considered because it has all the qualifications. If it has a tail, a lot of the females have the tail because they push into the ground and lay their eggs. And this is another one with a tail, smaller, different type of tail. Notice also it has all the other qualifications. We'll talk about the wings in a second. And here's a grasshopper that's not long head without a tail. Notice. So almost a regular type of grasshopper, just a different color. And it says of Yetzar Shiesh Mochagav, but you need a Mesora that it should be called a kosher grasshopper. That's what Chagav means over here. Because why? Because we don't know the difference with them. So why? Well, there is the Gemara says, what is that excluding? Who knows what that is? They're all over the place. The cricket all over the place, right? A cricket has all the qualifications. Okay? And if you don't have a misora, then maybe cricket's a kosher. So yeah, here we go. We have a checklist for a cricket. Four walking legs? Check. Two jumping legs? Check. Four wings? Check. All right? Wings cover most of his body? Check. Well, is it the kosher type? It seems that everybody agrees this is not the kosher type, except we're going to see some uh, disagree, but uh, with, according to the way we understand it now. So no cricket soup. We <laughs> so here's a, it's called in the Gemara Tzartzur, cricket, and here again you can have another picture. Here's another, it, you know why it's called Tzartzar? It's a, what do you call when the word is? Chirp. Uh, the word, yeah, it's chirp, but the, 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 what is it called? Anomatopoeia. Anomatopoeia, there we go. It, it sounds Tzartzur, 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 Tzartzur. So here's a cricket, and notice that they look like grasshoppers in this level. Can, 
Okay. All right. So now here's a little bit uh, of uh, we're going a little bit we're going leaving the psukim a little bit and going into a little bit of Gemara. So uh, why was it not enough? Remember the psukim told us the qualifications. Why isn't that enough? Right? Why do we need also right uh, samples? So here it says because we might think that all grasshoppers are kosher. Right? So it gives us four examples. Right, to exclude the crickets. And this we mentioned before, it's read as low with a vav in the Pasuk. So if you see over here, mikol arba lo and lo crime. So we said it's not just a textile uh, question. It really is teaching us lo means no and lo means yes. So what is that teaching me? So we have in tradition that Low means it does not have the jumping leg, and low means it does, because depending on its stage. And the Gemara, first what happens is she gives birth, she lays the eggs, she puts them in the ground, they come out, they crawl, they hop, all the small hops, they go, they shed, they do this a few times until finally they have full grown wings and full grown legs. So the Pasuk is telling us. Right? It does not, even when it doesn't have the jumping leg and it just hops over here, it's still kosher. You don't have to wait to eat it until it can jump and fly. So really, the Pasuk is saying it does not have the jumping leg that fly yet. And it tells you it does have the jumping leg and flies yet. And it's both teaching you that it's even kosher at this stage. And we're going to see that it also applies to the other parts. Let's say it doesn't have its wings yet. Right? So the Rambam and the tradition has that even though it didn't go full wings yet, and we said you need full wings, it's still kosher. Here is one at an early stage of a, a grasshopper. Here is one without small wings. But this is the kosher type. So even though it doesn't have the wing, the Pasuk says low, it still would be closer at this point. Here is, now over here it has the full grown legs, and that's the kosher type. Okay. So we learn from that, that even though it doesn't have it yet, it still grows. Now why did the Torah have to give us four examples? Remember we less, and the reason is because we saw Rashi tells us there's long heads and tails and and we're going to see some with humps, doesn't make a difference. It's telling you that all those differences, as long as you have the qualification, four walking legs, four wings, cover most of the body, two jumping legs, the Torah says it's all kosher. Why does it repeat it one more time? To tell you, you have to have a misura, though, that this is the type that was eaten, otherwise cricket could be a problem. So now, here's an example of humped one. You never knew there were so many different types of uh, uh, grasshoppers, huh? Here's another humped one. There's a different type of hump. Here's another. So you might think, what it's telling us is that you might think that, you know what? If it just says those four qualifications, and this is give you an example, all of these would be kosher or not kosher. They tell you it doesn't make a difference. They're all kosher. Now... The Gemara tells us the wings have to cover most of the body and the circumference. So here, here's a type that is has is wingless. And here's another one. This is totally not even has the qualification of wings. Here's wingless. You can see it has no wings, and this is full grown. Not just because it's small and wingless. Here's small wings. They don't even cover the length of the body. Here is wings that cover the length but not the circumference. Here it covers the length and the circumference. Now, there's one opinion that says that that's without the legs helping cover the body. So, do you notice over here in this one, the wings cover but the bottom part are covered with its legs. Is that qualified as kosher or not. So here we go. The, the Beit Yosef and the Shulchan Aruch for the Sfaradim says that it has to cover it like this without the legs blocking it. 
has to cover most of the body plus its circumference. And here we go, this is the kosher one, covering most of the body and the circumference. And here is it again. You can see the bottom of the body is right there. Without the leg, it's still covering. Okay, now a little bit of uh, uh, with regards to the tradition. This is a Mishnah. The Chachamim say it gives the four qualifications, just like fish. How do you know what a kosher fish is? Fins and scales. Fins and scales. You can take any fins and scales any place and it would be good. So let's say the same thing over here. Four legs, four wings, jumping uh, legs, and hand covers most of the body, and that's it. Right? Even with fish, though, they're... Oh, there's so, about like swordfish. Uh, okay, so we're gonna see. So Vie comes along, that's the Chachamim, comes along Rabbi Yossi said, wait, we need a tradition because there's some iffies. The question is, what is Rabbi Yossi doing? Is he arguing with the Chachamim? And the Allah is like the Chachamim and you don't need the tradition? Or he's explaining the Chachamim and you actually also need the traditions. It means all the signs plus that its tradition is that it is a kosher Chagah. And the answer is that according to some, right, and most of the, there's three opinions, we'll just stick with the final decision, that you do require a tradition. So now I'm going to present the Yemenite and Moroccan tradition. What happened with the Yemenite and Moroccan tradition is that the Arachim HaKadosh, which was Moroccan, he had the same tradition as the Yemenite. And when they used to come every two three years, they used to come a swarm. Everybody used to they used to the, the grasshoppers used to eat the grain. They used to go collect the grasshoppers, stick them in bags, and go and roast them. All right. So the Archaim came out and says, according to Rashi, remember the way Rashi said the head, the jumping legs on the front, it's not the right one. They all said, what do you mean? This is what we've been eating. The Archaim says. This is the wrong one according to Rashi. You're not allowed to eat it here anymore. Oops. So what happened is it's a miracle happened. It used to come every two, three years. It stopped coming for 12, 20 years. Because the Arachim said, and anybody who ate it had a nightmare dream that somebody was opening his mouth and shoving into him uh, snakes and scorpions. He came to the Arachim and says, what is that? What kind of a dream is that? He says, did you eat the grasshopper? He said, yes, because my father and grandfather ate it. So well, that's why you had a dream to show you that it's wrong. Because the only ones that had those dreams are the ones that didn't listen to me. And they stopped eating it in Morocco, except the Rabbanim that argued with them, like the Yemenite, and they continued. So here's the difference between the Rashi one, and this is the one that's the normal one. And I'll show you some differences. Here's what Rashi is saying, and this is not Rashi. So he's saying this is not the one. And here's another one over here. Notice the four legs here and the jumping leg here. Supposedly the Rashi one is supposed to be there. Okay, so again, so this is the Rashi type and this is the regular type. So to answer up, there's five answers to answer that tradition. Uh, I'll, I'll simplify it and not get into complication over here. But according to the Arachim and those, it's not only the Arachim Akadosh, but Arachim Tanievsky and Eric so also, he said that the reason you can't eat it again because it's not the Rashi grasshopper. Well, we don't have, like you said, it doesn't make sense and we don't have such grasshoppers. So he said it's like anything else that we don't have that became extinct. The fact that it's extinct can't say, well, we don't have it there, this must be the right one. So therefore, uh, he also rejected it. However, this well, the five answers are going to be from Rabbi Ratzabi, which was a Yemenite, to back up the Yemenite tradition. The first answer is the easiest one, and, and since Rashi says it, but it's not written in the Gemara the Shulchan Aruch, what are the four qualifications? I'm not going to test anybody. Right? Four wings, four legs, two jumping legs, and the wings covering Muslim. Very good. Oh, you guys all passed. We get a certificate for a costume set, right? So it says, but the Shulchan Aruch doesn't say the jumping leg has to be in the front. The Gemara doesn't say the jumping leg. So it could be some have in the front, even like you're saying that they extinct. But it could be some have it in the front, some. 
But the type we have still fills the qualification, and that's the tradition they had going back. Therefore, there's no reason to cancel the tradition. That's the first answer. Second answer is a little bit more to do with the wording. Answer two, three, four, all to do with putting the wording into Rashi that still fits the reality, according to this tradition. So the, remember, the problem was, Mimalaragav, this is the words in the Pasuk, Rashi says, above in the legs, some of the tzavar, close to the neck, yesh lo kiminch teraglayim. Rashi seems to say that close to the necks of the two legs, meaning the jumping leg, levad arbalagav, beside the four walking leg. So it sounds like Rashi, the two jumping legs are next to the neck. So the question is, we can answer it by saying, he says, it means high above are the two legs that are close to the neck. So with this picture, you understand it better. These two legs are close to the neck. The four legs are here. So you can still say the two jumping legs above are close to the neck. That's the only thing close to the neck. And therefore, it can also fit if you want to squeeze it into Rashi. What is that excluding? A leap hopper. A leap hopper also has jumping legs, but they're not high. Notice they're flat, right? So if we just go by the qualification and we don't insist it doesn't have to be high, it may be leap hopper is a kosher. So it excludes that, and here we have a checklist. Okay, four walking legs, it does have. Two jumping legs, it does have, but is it high? No, and the passage says it has to be high. Two, four wings, yes. Right, wings covering the body, yes. So basically, is it a type of grasshopper? And the answer is no. Okay, and this is, again, to explain according to this, Rashi, this is a diagram of grasshopper. The jumping leg is close to the neck above. When you're looking at it above the body, that's why the Pasuk says above the body, the jumping leg is close to the neck. So that's the way we can answer Rashi also. This we can say that Rashi just didn't know, because clearly he says it's a so unlike somebody else, that was theoretical, Rashi says he's silent with his eyes. We're going to see that's the last answer. Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, that's the, but they try to squeeze it into Rashi also, you'll we'll see. Because it can't be that Rashi, he's saying that we saw the grasshoppers all around us, and they have all this in mind. So they want, they, they want to say, it can't be that Rashi, what is, what is he looking at? Because there are some things that maybe Rashi has been... No, over here, no, over here, here you'll see. Was, yeah, you see, he knew long ahead. He, he was very... He knew all the differences. So, it's on. so this that's answer number two. No, number three, again, the problem is Rashi seems to say the legs, the jumping legs are right above. So over here, we want to say that means the jumping legs are above the walking legs when the grasshopper is upside down. Now, why in the world would we want to turn the grasshopper upside down and say the jumping legs are the above the, the neck? Well, because... That's the Orchaim himself says that when they shed, they do it about five times they shed, and that's the only time really you can see them stationary when they're upside down. The rest of the time they're jumping all around. Try to catch a grasshopper. I asked my, my boys, catch me a grasshopper so I can show it around. It's not so easy. They're flying and jumping all around. The time they're stationary, and that could be why the Pasuk is talking about, is when they shed. Here's a four example. They shed about five times. After they come out, each time they grow, they shed. So here, uh, you notice they're shedding upside down. And this is where you can see that the legs, right, uh, are higher. The jumping legs are higher than the, those legs by the neck. So that's another way of looking at it. And then the last one is, of course, this is where you have a text. We found a text. There's two people, two of the students of Rashi, quote Rashi himself as saying that the four legs are really, the two jumping legs is past the four legs. And plus we have found a text that has a dot right there, and it reads basically like that. That the two jumping legs are close to the neck, period. The, the legs are close to the neck, period. Then it describes the two legs. So basically it comes out that this, this text fits with the basic grasshopper. So it comes out that the first answer is that 
right, that it doesn't make a difference. All right, two, three, and four, we try to fit it into Rashi and saying that even Rashi is talking about the kosher grasshopper, right? Uh, but, and he saw it, but he had a difference, he disagreed about the Misara of it. The last one is that, right, that really if you don't want to accept them in any of our answers, what is the Misara based on of the Yemenite, the Moroccan? It's based on of Sa'ad Yagon, right? He was the one that simply said, the Pasuk says the crying, the knees is above the leg, the knee above the leg. The Pasuk says that it has the knee above, it's not, not the way Rashi is learning it. Right? It's, it has the knee is a crying, not the jumping leg. But the knee of the jumping leg is above its leg. And he specifically says the name of this Arbe. And that's what the Yemenite tradition is based on. And therefore, so the five answers, the first one is it doesn't make a difference, Rashi. The next two, three, and four is that we fit it into Rashi. And the last one is our Sadia is Gaon's tradition uh, that that's it. And here's an example, and here's just their tradition, and we just go. The tradition is based, but they have an interesting note to still clarify the tradition. They have, I'm going to show you, this is Rabbi Ratzabi's Kitzur, and he, has, he says that we have a tradition, one more. It's not in the halacha, but we, when we were growing up, there's a ches in the middle of their chest. First of all, this is a picture comparing the one he has and the one that I got. And he says there's a ches right here on their chest. And I'll, you'll see it a little bit better. There we go. Here we go. You want to see if the other ones have, look like it? Look at all these other types. Some of them are very facial. We can make a whole... Uh, but the kosher one, which is this one, it's, it's it, you need a little bit of uh, imagination, but it's more. It doesn't look like uh, some of these other ones. You can see that there's a difference. So in fact, they ask the answer by Ratzabi. It doesn't say that in the halacha either. Just like Rashi, he says you're right. This is we're not saying if it has a ches. That's the only qualification for the kosher. You need all the other tradition, but plus we added an extra thing for ourselves to make sure we got the right one in our area, and it has a ches. Uh, you can do the ches, which if you turn it sideways, it could be a chaf of kosher, you know. Chafke. <laughs> 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 yeah. We're still working on chafke, yeah. Chafke edition. But these are now the following is just pictures <laughs> of the kosher type. <laughs> Anybody want to try reading that again? This is the one that swarms. <laughs> yeah. This is the one that swarms. They come in multitudes. And this is when they're smaller without wings. But this is the kosher type. This is smaller without wings. It's a kosher type. This is the kosher type. This is not. This is. This is not. This is. This is not. This is. This is. This is the qualifications in summary. And, okay. Anybody wants to take a guess? The top left. The bottom. Sure. Okay, how many people vote for that? Yeah. How many people vote for that? No. For that? No. That one? Okay, how many people were right? <laughs> this is a test before I give you a certificate, you know? This is, you have to, pa you have to pass it. Okay? further back there. All right, how about this one? One more test. How many people for that? That one? That one. Uh, yes. That one. I think the right one. Okay. All right. Good job. I think the bottom left. All right, how many people get this? Yeah. All right, here we go. Hey, can we have volunteers for this? Who can read me that one? Who would like to read the qu first question? No. In one rely on someone else in the surah to eat grass hearts. Okay, so this is a question. Let's say you are not a Yemenite and not a Moroccan. Can I eat from it? So it goes, there's another Masloket, an argument by birds. If you don't have a tradition about a bird, can I rely on somebody else? Some people say yes, because I just don't know which one it is. I know the qualifications, it's there. 
But I just don't have a tradition that they ate it. So if he ate it, it's good enough for me. Others say no, because remember, we mentioned there's an opinion that says if you have the four signs like fish, you can eat anyone, including the cricket. So maybe they ate it because of that, not because they had a tradition that that was a kosher type. So there's an argument, and basically the answer would be, you ask your local rabbi. Okay, there's an argument, and yesh la'achmer, according to Rav Vadia, but it seems that in that uh, Misora dinner, some people in Eretz ate it, some people didn't eat it. Uh, you, you ask whichever way you post it. Did the I like the last eating it after the Arab Sabbath lunch? There was a big argument. Some stopped because of him. Others fought him till the end. It looks like, I, I don't see so many of the Moroccan continue, but the Yemenites continue. They sell them in Bosch Okay. How about, does a grasshopper need shita? No. no. One no. It's not a bar. It's a bar. It doesn't feel pain, doesn't have blood. Okay, the answer is no. Like fish. Like fish. Okay, how about the next one? Is there, is it usher to eat every night? Can I, in other words, usually we don't allow a person to just rip off uh, a limb and chew on it. The veil, are you talking about? Not in the veil. Yeah, no. You like cut off a live, limb. it's still alive, you cut off a foot. Just and you go and choose. It's called every minute of time. So, can I take the grasshopper and just twist off its head and eat it? No. Okay. No, right? If you eat another part of it, you're going to slap it in the mouth. No, no, well, is it every minute No, you can really tear off a piece and eat it. Now, we're going to see, like I see you're disgusted. So, we're going to see that there is an issue, even though it could be kosher. If it's disgusting, you're not allowed to eat it for a separate uh, reason. Now, can one eat alive? So that's a saying no because of Balti Shaksa, meaning being disgusting. If you're disgusted, then it doesn't make a difference if it's kosher, because anything disgusting you're not allowed to do, so it would be like any other disgusting food. What bracha of my grasshoppers? Who knows? Jackal? That's it. Okay, let's see if you're right. Okay. Shahakol. Is it par, meat, or par? Par. Par. Like fish. Like fish, huh? So, okay, well, it's half covered over there, but it's par. Okay, I think they're all passing and getting a certificate. Do a chaf, side with chaf, Okay, in case you wanted to know how it tastes. That was Rabbi Slimkin, and he said, he said, I'm just going to tell you, okay, imagine going, you have a restaurant over here that serves french fries? Yes. Okay, yes. nice, crunchy fries? french fries, crispy on the outside, mushy on the inside, the same thing. Oh. <laughs> That's the way he described it on his website. That's, That's the real crispy creeps, I'm telling you. Oh my crispy on the That's the end of the uh, presentation, <laughs> and it, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions of you. Let me just... But can we see the picture of Rabbi Slimkin again? <laughs> he's, the really wanna, uh, he's the zoo rabbi, right? He's the zoo rabbi. Oh, can get right. What's his name? Uh, so he's he experienced this. Yeah. They, and during that, I got his quote on the dinner. They interviewed him about the dinner masara. He was one of the people that ate, and that's the way he described it. Even if it's not his tradition? Huh? He can eat, even if it sounds his best. Right, so there's an argument if you're going to rely on the Yemenite tradition. Some say yes, some say no. He was one of the people that followed those that said yes. Okay. So some people said no. Right, I guess I'll take questions uh, right now from anybody. And then I have an interesting story to end up with. This reminds me about uh, last story. Yeah, questions? Yeah. So the opinion is that if you come from North America and you have no concern whatsoever in any of your ancestors, you could be grasshoppers. You could, because, or some people say you could because some of the same. Right. Not only that, we can eat it because we're relying on the air and the soil. What kind of nutritional value do they have? That I don't know. Okay, why would anybody want to eat it? Okay, the question is why would anybody want to eat it? I will explain to you. I mean, I'm going to... The reason for it you, is... Just one question. You're a Yemenite? Yeah. So you, did you eat growing up eating it? No, yeah, I, but I saw people eat it. You saw people eat it. This I'm, type specifically? This is the minarbe. Yeah. They used oh, to import you it. You don't need me. You have a, a live... <laughs> they used to import it from Yemen via Ethiopia because there was no connection. But if you go to Rosh Ain, even now, you can buy it in the market. And people love it. There we go. Want to know why? Like French fries. Yeah, yeah. People love it. Uh, don't buy the that. 
It's yeah, it can cover with chocolate if you want. There's chocolate, there is chocolate covered ones. I, I know, yeah. You can have all the recipes. Any recipe. It's like, bad. <laughs> it's it's bad. No, no, don't. Uh, it's the same thing chocolate. about me. You know, if I look at uh, many things, many people eat food. I say, well, I can't give it to fish. Uh, you know. <laughs> but the fact that the two that, that we're not used to it here, but in right. the Arab countries, they eat not only this, they eat all, the, all the insects. In the uh, Japanese Chinese. and the other countries, the Asian countries, they eat a lot of things like dogs and cats and oh, yeah, squids. Yeah, and so yeah. the thing is, this yeah. guy gave us, you don't have to eat it. But if you wish, then you have a choice. But uh, I think Baltimore, Chicada, you know, the one that they're jump off the ground, they eat it, yeah? Cicada. They, over there they do. Cicada. It's interesting, the cicadas, it's when they come, so they, they produce them, and they put all these recipes, and restaurants sell them. Oh. So oh. It, it's, 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 a, it's a fad, you know, people yeah. like trying it. I guess so. The non-juice. Uh, <laughs> they eat it, yeah. Well, what do they care? It's, uh, it's something interesting that comes once in a while. Why not try it? That they sell them in, uh, I think, California, they sell candied insects. There we go. So you don't have to go that far. They sell ants and a lollipop in there. Oh, the clear lollipop with little ants and I guess the argument is, how do you interpret that? Can I rely on someone else's tradition? Yeah. And how do we deal with all kinds of animals that we eat that, um, for example, the famous one that pops up is a turkey? How do we as Svanadim eat a turkey uh, if we don't have a tradition that says an animal is a kosher? Okay. So it's almost similar. They bring the same akhlaqa. With the turkey, I happen to have done on the turkey. So over there with the turkey, they said the following. The problem is not for us. The problem is for them. <laughs> We also rely now, also the Svarnam also say we can't rely on the Simanim, we can't rely on the signs, we need the tradition. It's clearly we can identify some things that are not kosher as kosher with the Right, simanim. so what happened is, what was the problem? Why, the Allah only says the, the signs for the kosher birds. By birds, everybody gives the only sign. Later on, what happened is they went out and they ate, went in the field, they said, okay, let's say it has A, B, C signs. It's kosher. They went and checked it and ate it. All of a sudden, they see it swooping down <coughs> and it's grabbing an animal, which automatically makes it not kosher. So they decided, okay, we're no longer going to eat without a tradition. Comes along the turkey. It was actually brought by the Spaniards and ended up being grown in Spain. So the Spaniard Jews, according to this is one version of how it developed, they at that point did not accept the Roma the one that said that we only rely on the Surah. At that point, they held it was good just by the Simani. Later on, they changed and accepted everything, but then it was good. Comes along to Ashkenazi, well, we don't have the tradition to eat it. It's an American bird. But let's see, what's the reason that we started not following the, 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 the just eating any bird? Because it could be as a swoop, but it's already been with the Spaniard Jews for 400 years. And we know it's not the type. So they said in that case we can rely on them. So by birds, Malan doesn't say that we need a misalan? So you say Mahlaqim. Yes, he says like this. Yesh omi masur, yesh omi mutar, and yesh mahmir. So it sounds a mikar adin, it's mutar. But he's a mahmir. So how do you learn? Do you understand that it means it's mutar and you don't want to be mahmir, it's okay? Or do you understand that these times it's still be mahmir? He actually brings three ways of learning the whole sugya. So how Avadia wouldn't rely on so the Yalkut Yosef is the one that I quoted up there. So when he doesn't allow people to eat grasshoppers, he would have a problem with turkey also? No. Or turkey no? Is, is a little bit less of a problem because we hold already early on, before we switch, that it's okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any, Any other else? questions? Questions? Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Hope you enjoy. Thank you. It was, very, it was lots of pleasure. <laughs> and it's always good to see you, Jonathan. And, uh, <laughs> There's a tremendous uh, thing that's happening over here. You don't realize that uh, Svartim need need to continue our traditions. We just need to keep on, on, on developing. And uh, as the, we, we, we have, like what Ravai says, heter beter, Ashkenazi marrying uh, Svartim, Svartim, we need to all join together and share the tradition. But not that we should lose it. You know, uh, If we would lose it, we're down to one Arbe. The, the Yemenites still have four. 
that the yellow one and the red one, they have two, three other ones. Well, I don't, again, I did not eat it. But you didn't eat it, but I'm saying... Eat it, and it used to be sold in Roshan Market. Mm -hmm. Roshan Market, you can go and buy, still buy it. So they, 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 you know, to, to, we got to keep it, we're losing. So there's two people, the Aries and Aries from Baltimore, they moved to Aries. So they're the one that started this, this Masora. They go and video all the people of Masora that were lost to keep it alive. And they make this dinner that, uh, that to spread, once you spread the Masora, hopefully it's... Uh, okay. Also the OU. Okay. OU. The OU. The OU. We're going to do right now. Um, I'm just going to ask if we can, everyone wants to go get a brachat from the Rav, you can ask <laughs> Um, and then afterwards, <laughs> I had to, I did this, if I did this to Rabbi Rosenbaum, I could do it to Rabbi Rosenbaum. Yeah, you can. Rabbi Rosenbaum, 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 Rabbi Rosen